protecting marital faithfulness and the purity uh, in Israel's camp. This is what we're reading through today in Numbers chapter 5. So I invite you to grab your Bibles and read along with me as we continue our journey to read through the entire Bible, uh, one chapter and one day at a time. Um, and I uh, just want to show off my new shirt. Uh, my wife picked this up for me uh, as a Valentine's gift. I got my skater look going on. Got to grab my eat, my hair, hair and throw it out just a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I like the message. I like the shirt. Just be nicer to people. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, uh, with that, uh, we're going to jump into um, Numbers chapter 5. Um and basically what's going on right now is the Israelites uh, have been out of Egypt for about a year. They crossed the sea. Uh, the, re the sea collapsed back. Uh, they've been getting manna and stuff like that from food. And now you have like the, a couple million people out in the desert and they're getting organized and they're getting established as they're going to you know, go on for the next 39 years wandering through the desert. God is laying the foundations on how to keep everyone together, keep things safe, keep things going, and kind of protecting uh, the people. And right now, uh, up to this point, we've been talking about each tribe and their location and their roles. This army is going to do this. Uh, this group and this family, this clan are going to do this. And then this clan is going to do that. Um, and that's kind of where we've been going thus far so it seems like today we're going to get into um some more personal things um so i'm excited i just kind of read the titles there's a couple things in here that foreshadow towards christ so i'll definitely be sure to bring those up at the end um but for now yeah let's jump into acts not acts that was the last book we read let's read through numbers chapter five <clears throat> purity in the Lord's camp. The Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Command the people of Israel to remove from the camp anyone who has a skin disease or a discharge or who has become ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person. This command applies to men and women alike. Remove them so they will not defile the camp in which I live among them. So the Israelites did as the Lord commanded Moses and removed such people from the camp. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, men or women, betray the Lord by doing wrong to another person, they are guilty. They must confess their sin and make full restoration for what they have done, adding in addition, an additional 20% and returning it to the person who was wronged. But if the person who was wronged is dead and there are no near relatives to whom restoration can be made, the payment belongs to God and must be given to the priest. Those who are guilty must also bring a ram as a sacrifice, and they will be purified and made right with the Lord. All the sacred offerings that Israel, the Israelites bring to a priest will belong to him. Each priest may keep all the sacred donations that he receives. Protecting uh, marital faithfulness. Uh, verse 11. And God said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Suppose a man wife, a man's wife goes astray and she is unfaithful to her husband and has sex with another man, but neither her husband nor anyone else knows about it. She has defiled herself, even though there was no witness and she was not caught in the act. If her husband becomes jealous and is suspicious of his wife and needs to know whether or not she has defiled herself, the husband must bring his wife to the priest. He must also bring an offering of two quarts of barley flour to be presented on her behalf. Do not mix it with olive oil or frankincense, for it 
is a jealousy offers offering an offering to prove whether or not she is guilty the priest will then present her to stand trial before the lord you must take some holy water in a clay jar and pour it into the dust he has taken from the tabernacle floor when the priest has presented the woman before the lord he must unbind her hair and place her hair or place in her hands the offering of proof the jealousy offering to determine whether her husband's suspicions are justified the priest will stand before her holding the jar of bitter water that brings a curse to those who are guilty the priest will then put the woman under oath and say to her if no other man has had sex with you and you have not gone astray and defiled yourself while under your husband's authority may you be immune from the effects of this bitter wa water that brings on the curse but if you have gone astray by being unfaithful to your husband and have defiled yourself by having sex with another man at this point the priest must put the woman under oath by saying may the people know that the lord's curse is upon you when he makes you infertile causing your womb to shrivel and your abdominal to swell now may this water that brings a curse enter your body and cause your abdomen to swell and your womb to shrivel and the woman will be required to say yes let it be so uh and the priest will write these curses on a piece of leather and wash them off into the bitter water he will make the woman drink the bitter water that brings on the curse when the water enters her body it will cause bitter uh, suffering if she is guilty the priest will uh, take the jealousy offering from the woman's hand lift it up before the Lord and carry it to the altar he will make a handful of flour as a token portion and burn it on the altar and he will require the woman to drink the water if she has defiled herself by being unfaithful to her husband the water that brings on the curse will cause bitter suffering her abdomen will swell and her womb will shrink and her name will become a curse among her people but if she has not defiled herself and is pure then she will remain unharmed and she will be able to have children this is the ritual law for dealing with suspicion if a woman goes astray and defiles herself while under her husband's authority or if a man becomes jealous and and is suspicious that his wife has been unfaithful the husband must present his wife before the lord and the priest will apply this entire ritual law to her the husband will be innocent of any guilt in this matter but his wife will be held accountable for her sin may god add a blessing to the reading of act or numbers chapter five that's a lot heavier than i was expecting uh getting into it uh for sure so um yeah let's uh talk about that uh process it there's a couple things that jumped into my head um for sure but first i want to point out the parts that are uh foreshadowed to christ so uh the first part here numbers five one to four the lord gave these instructions to moses command the people of israel to remove from the camp anyone who has a skin disease or discharge who has become ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person this command applies to men and women alike remove them so they will not be defiled so they will not defile the camp in which i live among them so the israelites did as the lord commanded and moses removed such people from the camp the new testament is full of people who fit in the one category or another of off limits but jesus invites off limits people into close relationship with him john 4 9. um and then uh numbers 5 11 and 12 and the lord said to moses give the following instructions to the people of israel suppose a man's wife goes astray and she is unfaithful to her husband um the woman the pharisees catch in adultery is considered defiled worthless but jesus gives this woman back her life and her dignity john 8 1 and 11. um so yeah 
I, 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 I like a couple of these things quite a bit. I'm going to start off with the, the last one. Um, so this is kind of the law about protecting faithfulness and everything in there. And if you've ever uh, been close to a family or been in a family where the husband or the wife uh, has cheated, the mom or the dad has cheated, um, the how much that impacts uh, people, uh, even two or three degrees outside of that relationship. It's such a negative thing and why, you know, as they're traveling, it's so important to kind of have these married relationships uh, stay and it's one uh, like stay as important as they are. But um, at the end of the day, like these people were like in Jesus time, they were going to stone her and the guys weren't going to get any sort of issues. And Jesus goes, I can forgive even this sin. We don't know exactly what was going on, but Jesus is like, I'm going to forgive this as well, which I think is really, really powerful and really, really awesome. And there's a lot of that Jesus did that was just completely revolutionary and lifting up women. Um, and here at this time, it's very much talking uh, to a group of people that had this understanding on what uh, marriage was, which is defined and very different than what our understanding of marriage is today. Um, it's very easy and simple to um, take our understanding and apply it to what we're reading today, but things were definitely a bit different back then. Arranged marriages were definitely a thing. Um, and there was a lot of other rituals and, and things that went into a marriage back then that we just don't do today. Um, but also dating wasn't a thing back then either. Um, and yeah, the, this kind of hits home for me in a couple different ways. Um, but I'll get to that part, uh, afterwards. Um, but you know, the sanctity of marriage and everything was still something that was very important uh, back then. And the uh, there is a part that I do find disturbing in here. And that is the husband is not going to uh, be punished for the wrongdoing. I can't imagine being in a relationship where Candace sus suspects me of cheating when I haven't. And I got to go through this whole ceremony and, you know, proof happens that I, I have not uh, sinned. How does that relationship go back to being normal? All right. And how does Candace's suspicion um, not necessarily get rewarded or punished or whatever? It's just it's just going to be so awkward afterwards. And you know, life after such an accusation, I think would be very tough. But then what happens if it was like proven that like I had, how does life go? It doesn't say divorce them. It just says that you're not going to be able to have kids with them, uh, which is a whole other thing. It's, it's confusing. Um, part of that I think is to really nail down how important relationships are. And we'll see like throughout so much of the old Testament, a lot of the laws are about the sanctity of relationships in the household. Um, you know, protecting the family unit, protecting parents, protecting kids, respecting, protecting women and wives and daughters and protecting husbands and sons. That is something that is throughout the, the whole Bible, especially the Old Testament. And they took those relationship laws uh, way, way more seriously, um, with much graver consequences than we do now. Uh, now, you know, cheating and all of that stuff is almost doesn't have the correct weight attached to it, right? Um, if you choose to do that selfish act, you are shattering someone's world and someone's trust that they've given you, like they've given you their heart, especially day after Valentine's day, 
thinking about that stuff. If you're cheating, you're betraying the person that has cho chosen to give like their life to you in some of the most vulnerable ways. Their heart, mind, soul, like if you're married as well, like physical, like you're giving that over to the other person. So the Bible really holds that stuff up as serious, right? This is serious. Um, and uh, the part that really hits home is really challenging to hear is about the whole, like, um, that sinful side of, you know, not having kids and all of that sort of jazz. And um, it hits home because we had a miscarriage uh, during the pandemic. It's a little over a year ago. So uh, just reading this is kind of hard. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, get addressed later on in Jesus' time that are not coming to mind right now. Um, but there's opportunities to grow even if, you know, there's a lot of medical reasons now that kids, it's not necessarily a curse. Um, there, so there's a lot more knowledge and wisdom there. Um, and, yeah, it's... Um, it's definitely fascinating, definitely interesting, uh, definitely hard to read um, and to process there. <clears throat> um, but like that curse still, like if that cheating happens, it still affects the husband as well. Um, in this time, no matter what, it, <laughs> it impacts the family and their unit. Um, is a big point that I'm driving home. Um, so don't cheat <laughs> is part of the message there. Uh, then the other side of things, which I also thought was interesting near the beginning is, um, like that. I'm just going to read it. Um, verse six, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any people, if any of the people, men or women, betray the Lord by doing wrong to another person, they are guilty. Um, and it's just that idea of don't go out of your way and purposely do wrong and purposely hurt somebody else, right? And ultimately, cheating is that when we are selfishly thinking about things, especially back then when they had this community mindset and it wasn't as individualized as ours. Uh, and it could be wronging someone on like a bad deal, bad trade, whatever. And it encourages to give 20% uh, more than whatever the wronged was, whatever the value of the wrong was, which, you know, shows like I'm going above and beyond uh, what I did wrong for forgiveness. There's that reminder that when we take things selfishly, um, it's costing us more than the value of what we actually took, which, you know, there is like, if I decided to break into someone's car and steal the change from, you know, their car, I'm not just stealing the change, right? The person that has the car is now feeling violated. Their personal belongings have now been broken into. They're feeling vulnerable. Their sense of safety is now robbed from them. Right. And I'm speaking out of like personal experience. Like I had my car broken into not that long ago and things were taken from me. Um, some things that just were like, you just took that to make my life miserable, didn't you? Um, and for a while, yeah, it just felt unsafe and that was taken from me more than what was actually taken out of the vehicle. Uh, was those other things. So and the materialism attached to it is not just that materialism. Um, and when we do wrong to others, it's not just that wrong. There's more things that are unintentional consequences of our selfish actions. So that 20% extra is a reminder that what we take actually takes more than what we intended to take. That wrong does more wrong than what we intended to do as wrong. 
Um, and I think that's a solid reminder and that 20% is there to hopefully get us to start thinking in those broader senses when we have those temptations. Um, and then uh, the other thing too, like if that person has gone, then, you know, go to a relative and then if the relatives are gone, then find a worthy cause to give it to. In this case, it was giving it to the priest, giving it to the church so that they can then go and bless and love on others and pass that forward. Um, and so that the priest can eat and do everything that they needed to do as well. Pay the bills, if you will. So that idea of what I, I have done and what I have taken uh, or whatever for myself is greater and I want to repay that. I'm going to repay that by, by, and I take the knowledge that, you know, what I took was actually more than what I intended to take as well. I'm going to pay that back to the family. I'm going to pay that back to the person. I'm going to make sure that it, it goes there. And that's kind of the idea behind it. I think, uh, that's my understanding of it. So, um, yeah, a little bit of an encouraging and also a little bit of a depressing uh, part of scripture, but let's pray. Uh, that's always the best way to do, best way to end things off. Remember, be nicer to people. Uh, AJC, awesome Jesus Christ, uh, thank you so much uh, for Numbers chapter 5. Uh, may you continue to bless um, uh, us. And as we dig in through your word and read challenging uh, parts like this, um, and that reminder that you really do care about our relationships and how we treat one another. Um, it's such an important aspect on your commands to us, how we treat each other. And I thank you for that reminder uh, that I had earlier on today about that new command that you get, gave us to love others as you love them, Lord. You came down from heaven. You humbled yourself. You lived amongst them. You lived amongst us. And you were willing to die for. You were willing to live for. And you were willing to die for. And as people wrongfully put you up on the cross, you still were able to ask for forgiveness and extend that love, Lord. I don't know if I have that capacity to love like you, but help me to develop it. Help me to develop that kind of love, Lord, and to keep your commands there and to teach others to be able to keep your commands and what your commands are. And today it was a lot about relationships and how we treat one another. So help give us that ability to treat one another with the fruits of your spirit, Lord. Love, joy, patient, patient, patientness, um, self-control, um, there's so many others that I'm now just drawing a blank on because I got tongue tied. Um, but yeah, Lord, help us to, to, uh, to care for others using the fruits of your spirit. Help us to develop those in our life daily. Help us to arm ourselves with the armor of God, your armor, Lord. And Lord, help us to acknowledge when we have wronged someone, when we've acted in that selfish way and taken way more than we intended to take. Lord, help us to work together towards love and to have that acknowledgement that our actions impact more than just us. Lord, help us to see and to hear uh, how we impact those around us. And Lord, help us to develop ways and patterns that look more and more like you. And for those that have suffered through miscarriages and, and issues, as we read verses like this, Lord, help keep in mind about all the verses in the New Testament that talk about your love and your forgiveness and how even things like that can bring you glory. Lord, it's hard to, to read these verses and not just get stopped and get discouraged and get demotivated. But Lord, I thank you for these verses, uh, to know the history and why there's stigma to it. And Lord, 
yeah, these relationships are are important. And like, if someone was going around cheating, there'd be questions on lineage. There'd be questions on so much stuff that was leading towards you. If people were going around cheating and having multiple husbands, especially, it'd be really hard to follow their lineage back to you. But Lord, I thank you that in your family tree, there is actually a prostitute. And it can be difficult to follow that, that family line all the way through. But even your family line got messy. And Lord, as our family lines are probably very messy as well. Um, Lord, help us to stay focused on you and acknowledge that we are your adoptive sons and daughters. And help us to find our identity in you. <sighs> that prayer went a lot of different directions, Lord. So I lift it all up. I lift this all up to you, Lord, in your name. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for joining me. Have a fantastic rest of your day. God bless. Bye.